Hey everybody, it's Captain Nabs here with you with part two of my tutorial series on how to fly the Embraer E-175 aircraft. In part one, we looked at powering up the aircraft using the internal safety inspection and the power-up checklist, and now we're going to move on to the before start process. The before start process is a bit of a lengthy process as this covers everything necessary to get the aircraft ready for flight. So I'm going to divide it into three separate sections. We're going to do the overhead flow initially, then we're going to prepare the MCDU, and then we're going to complete our glare shield and pedestal flow and get through the before start checklists. I'm going to divide this video into three parts to keep it fairly manageable and to also make it easy for you to find the sections that you're actually looking for as you deal with this aircraft. I should have said it in the first video, but I'll say it now, that these procedures that I'm going to show you represent a basic Embraer SOP and are mostly taken directly from the Embraer standard operating procedures published by the manufacturer. However, there have been some tweaks made to the procedures that I do by the airline that I worked for, and every airline is free to make their own tweaks and changes to procedures as they see fit, as long as they don't remove procedures. As a result, what you see may not resemble everything that other Embraer operators do, but uh, I hope it gives you a very good insight onto how to operate the aircraft and gives you a good basic set of procedures to operate this aircraft. So without further ado, let's step in the flight deck and get started. Welcome back to the Embraer flight deck as we begin our preparations for flight. The first step in the before start procedure actually does not involve the overhead panel, but involves the MCDUs. The first step in any aircraft setup is usually to tune the frequencies that are needed on the radio, especially company dispatch frequencies on COM2, so that dispatch can get a hold of you during the preparation process if they need to for any reason. The other part that usually happens here is initialization of the ACARS system. However, since the ACARS system is not currently being simulated, we're just going to skip past that step. So the bulk of the initial setup happens here on the overhead panel. The before start procedure for the Embraer uses a flow pattern followed by a checklist at the very end of the before start setup. On the overhead panel, the flow will move down each column, top to bottom, starting on the left hand side and then moving column by column over to the right. You'll literally go through every button on the overhead panel to make sure it is correctly positioned. So let's go ahead and do it now. Some of you may be thinking that we just did this when we did the internal safety inspection, since we covered most of the systems here on the overhead panel, and that is correct. However, you need to consider the fact that the internal safety inspection is only done when, a power, when an aircraft is initially powered up. So if you're doing a turn, landing, and then departing on another flight right away without powering the aircraft down and up again, you won't do the internal safety inspection. So we have to do a complete overhead flow to make sure everything is where it should be. Likewise, if you take over an aircraft from another crew and the aircraft is already powered, again, we need to go through the overhead panel and make sure that everything is as it should be. As we prepare to go through the overhead panel, you'll note that as we do go through this panel, we don't actually move that many switches. For the most part, all of the systems in the Embraer are fairly automated and are normally left in the auto position. As you look at the panel right now, you'll see that almost all of the knobs are at the 12 o'clock position. The switches are all up and the push buttons are all pushed in. And this is the normal operating position for almost all of the switches on the flight deck. I'll emphasize the ones that shouldn't be at 12 o'clock or forward or pushed in at this point in time, but most of them will be. Starting in the top left corner, we start with the DVDR control panel, which we don't actually need to do anything to because the CVR only needs to be tested once a day and is tested at power up on the first flight of a day. On the electric panel, both IDGs should be at the 12 o'clock auto position, and the orange disconnect lights should be out. The GPU should be on or off as required. The AC bus ties should be at the 12 o'clock auto position. The APU gen should always be pushed on whether the APU is running or not. And the TRU switches should all be in the forward position. Last but not least, at this point, the batteries should be in the on and auto position at 12 o'clock, and the DC bus ties should be at auto. Below the electric panel is the cockpit lighting panel. You can adjust the main panel, overhead panel, and pedestal backlighting systems to meet your needs, whether it's daytime or nighttime, and you need them bright or dim. One thing you will need to do, however, is press the enunciator test button. Press and hold, and you'll see all of the white buttons and orange buttons come on around the flight deck. I'm not going to pan down right now, but there are a number of lights on the lower panel as well that come on. 
There's also a switch here for the dome light, which provides general illumination to the flight deck for night flying. So select it on or off as required for your flight. On the second column, first is the engine one fire extinguishing handle, which should be pushed all the way in. On the fuel panel, all the switches should be at the 12 o'clock position, which means the cross feed is off and all the fuel pumps, AC pump one, AC pump two, and the DC pump are all in the auto position. On the passenger signs panel, the emergency light switch should be armed from our power up checklist. And if it's not, we would arm it at this time. We also turn on the no smoking because smoking is pretty much never allowed in any aircraft anymore. And if we're done fueling, we'll turn on the fasten seatbelt sign. If we're still refueling, leave the fasten seatbelt sign off and that's an indication to the flight attendants that fueling is taking place right now. The last switch on this panel is the sterile light panel. What the sterile light button does is turns on a light in the cabin to indicate to the flight attendants that now is a sterile period for the flight deck, usually below 10,000 feet, where calls to the flight deck should be kept to a minimum. It's also sometimes used to signal the flight attendants when they can get out of their seats and start their cabin service. So the sterile light is usually switched on for departure, switched off at 10,000 feet to indicate that it's safe for the flight attendants to get up and move around or call the flight deck if necessary, and then it's switched back on again at 10,000 feet in the descent, again to indicate to the cabin to prepare for landing. It's not modeled now, but it will be modeled in the future versions of this aircraft. Next comes the fire extinguishing panel. This contains switches to activate the fire extinguishers for the forward and aft cargo hold and the APU, as well as a test button. There's no need to test this right now, as it should have been tested at power up. And the forward and the aft and APU switches should all be in the out guarded positions. Next comes the APU control panel. Again, if we need the APU now, we could start it now, or we could wait until closer to engine start to start the APU depending on your needs. There's also an emergency stop button here that stops the APU without its normal cooldown period. This switch should be again pushed out and guarded. Next comes the windshield wipers. They should be off when we're sitting at the gate because they don't do us any good and will probably just damage the glass if we leave them running. Not to mention annoy us with the sound of the wipers going back and forth all day. Next are the lights panel. Normally at this point in time, we would have the nav light on and if it was nighttime, the logo light. All of the rest of the lights should normally be off at this time. At the top of the fourth column is again, the engine two fire extinguishing handle, which should be pushed all the way in. Below this is the hydraulics panel. On the hydraulics panel, the engine pump shutoffs for engines one and two should be out and guarded. The PTU should be in the auto position and electric pumps one, two, and 3B should all be in the auto position. The only switch that should be off is electric pump 3A, which you'll notice has no auto position. It's either off or on. It should be off until we're ready to start the engines. Below this is the pressurization panel. The mode switch should be at the auto position. The cabin altitude should be at the center stop position. The LFE selection knob should also be at the center position. And the dump switch should be in the out and guarded position. For the last column, we start with the de-icing panel. All of the five black push button switches should be pushed in to ensure that all the icing systems are operating when they are required automatically. Additionally, the mode system should be at auto and the test switch should be at off. The air conditioning and pneumatics panel similarly has seven black switches, all of which should be pushed in for normal operation at this point in time. Additionally, you'll see cockpit and passenger cabin temperature control knobs. These can be adjusted to suit your temperature as required. There's also an attendant position on the passenger cabin. If you turn the knob fully counterclockwise, this transfers control of cabin temperature to the flight attendant panels and allows them to directly control cabin temperature rather than having to call you every time they want the temperature in the cabin adjusted. And the last thing on the overhead panel is the passenger oxygen panel. The selector switch should be at the central auto position and the masks deployed light should be off. And that's it for the overhead panel. For the next step, we're going to get into the MCDU and actually start programming our flight. So you may be quickly asking yourself, why do we do the MCDUs after the overhead panel? And why do we not continue flowing through the glare shields and down into the pedestal before we program the MCDU? And the simple reason is that some of the values we need to set up the guidance panel, namely the speed, will require us to program the MCDU first to determine what our flap retraction speed will be set to. 
So that's it for part two of this tutorial series. In part three, we'll focus on setting up the MCDU before we finally finish the rest of the before start flows. We'll see you in the next video.